Okay, ready or not, welcome to the next uh, Grumpy Science episode in which Bob and Mark stop screwing around and we talk about real science with real data. So we're going to try something here. Hopefully, you know, we're going to we're going to follow our rule one take and you get it warts and all mistakes and all. But we're going to embed the video into a PowerPoint presentation and then turn that into a single video and we're going to post it. So you can and, watch this. And so if it looks really ugly, it's looks, all his fault. Yeah, it's totally my fault because I'm totally <laughs> incompetent. But what we're going to do, we're going to we're going to actually um, Talk about a real scientific study that Mark and I did on really oh traumatic brain injury well, and pulse electromagnetic field, but that comes a little bit farther. We've got to give you a little bit of home. We are always being the the nerdy academic type uh, educators we are. We like to teach you a little bit of something about what we're doing, and so so why would we even combine our methods, and why would you even use a brain gauge to look at the effects of treatment and you know, how many times have you ever been told to take a full course of antibiotics that lasted seven days or five days, but after day two, you felt fine and you quit taking them. And right. then guess what happened after day two? Oh, uh, you got sick again. Right. So you follow the finish. doctor's orders. And but doctors basically, how do, you, how do you do treatments that last long enough? How do you basically uh, guide treatment and how do you, how do you see if treatment is working? Mm -hmm. So you might not even be doing anything that works, or you might be doing something that works better. So it's kind of like a brain hacking tutorial is what this turns out to be. If you want to um, hack your brain, it takes a little bit more than just saying, you know, I feel smarter, I feel better. We're actually going to show you how to measure that so that you can say quantitatively, have you changed the way your brain is working? And we're doing this in this study in the context of traumatic brain injury, people who have real injuries that were in our study. And so Mark and I are going to go through, well, mostly Mark, because it's mostly Mark's work, so, so go through and explain it. With apologies to our multimedia center, we're going to sign off now and then start doing well, let's the try PowerPoint Well, let's try to make smooth transitions here. Let's try to be really cool. <laughs> They're going to, so you won't this, even notice. You won't the, even the, notice the, the fact that like, we change hats and I change a shirt and everything <laughs> in between slides. Try not to notice because production values are, are really low here at Grumpy Science. Okay. All right. Ready? Okay, well, hold on a second. My head got really small. <laughs> <laughs> quick recap. <laughs> quick recap. Uh, this is a quick recap on, on slide number one that you're looking at. And this is a quick recap of what the brain gauge is, what the brain gauge does. And we're going to show you pilot study results in, in a few slides. And it may be a beer or two later. But either way, if you look at this slide, one thing that you'll see is you'll see a computer monitor with a brain gauge attached to it. And on the computer monitor at the top, you see a picture of the, uh, the history that's been tracked on this one particular individual. And on the other side, on one side, you see the bar graph. And this is the kind of data that, you, this is the data display that is typical of what people look at after they test themselves. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what that data means. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more about some other stuff right after that. Slide number three, or two, actually. We're, we're counting ourselves as, slide, as one of the slides. So basically what you see on this slide is sample results. And we're trying to say, you know, we've got good, bad, and ugly uh, results up here. Uh, good results are all green. That's easy to remember. Full bars are full scale. Green lights and green. each of those measures means something else. And basically you've got a bar for each of the different measures that are taken. And when you take a full set of measures, you can get a full profile. So, Mark, would you please tell us what those measures are? Because they might be a little small for some people to read. But well, I don't have my glasses on either. You, think, you, I, you think I have any idea what though. they are? So, no, okay, you know, the, the top one is work. the top. The top <laughs> value is speed, and that is so. We have two versions of the values that you're looking at. On the well, you can't see the cursor move around. But, you know, the, the thing on the right are price. bar charts, and the thing on the left is called a radar plot. And some people like the radar plot, some people like the bar charts. Uh, old farts like me kind of like the bar charts. and uh, I'm kind of old school. I like yeah, the bar charts. Yeah. The radar charts are kind of sexy, but, you know, but, you know we are Our probably have user. a very skewed view of what that terminology Our means. Our super users love the radar plot. Yes, yeah. so that's why they're there. So. so accuracy score, that is derived from 
your amplitude discrimination measure and go back and watch those old things about lateral inhibition and all that kind of stuff. You Do want you to hear about that. Uh, speed, that's derived from your reaction time and your reaction time variability. And we talked about that before. Uh, focus, everybody knows what focus is. If you have trouble with well, attending focus? something, if, oh, you're, I'm sorry. Yeah, if, your attention, <laughs> if you can't pay attention, your Man, focus score, to fall asleep. Bob's focus score is down here around the bottom now. What are we talking uh, <laughs> uh, What else we got up there? TOJ, or temporal order judgment, that tells you, you know, what the order, you, you're good at telling one or one Stimulus is coming before another, sort of, you know, a little bit of timing in the frontal part of, of the cortex. Sort of like knowing whether we're on slide three or two, not saying. Yes, something like that. Something like that. Timing perception, that really has a lot to do with how well your cere cerebellar cortex is doing. And yes, your cerebellum, the back of your head. Yeah, right? so timing. some measures go with the back of your head, some with the front, and some with are systemic and have to do with everything. Yep. So just glancing at that, most people, most people, not everyone, intuitively know that what you see on the very bottom, the two charts on the bottom, that's not good. And the ones on the top, that's very good. So, you know. A person's hurting, you know, on the bottom. So let's go to the next slide. All right, let's go to the next slide. Try not to fall off here. Slide number three or four, if you're counting. Or whatever. Like whatever. Okay, so let's look at a sample of somebody who recovered from acute concussion. Now, we did promise you a TBI PEMF study. We're getting there. We've gone through sample results. Now we got to go through, what does it look like when you have a concussion of very short? So top left, you know, on the very far left side. So this isn't three different people. This is one person on three different days. Exactly. This so is one showing person. recovery of one person over about a two-week period. Right. And so day one, we call day zero the day they get a concussion. Day one after the concussion, their scores are pretty bad. Day six, they're starting to look a lot better. By the way, the average day in our studies when people pass impact is around day six or seven. Impact is an online neurocognitive test that is the quote unquote standard for, for testing people. So if you got kids playing sports and somebody says, "Oh, they cleared impact; they're ready to go," mm -hmm. it magic they magically uh, seem to clear on day seven, which happens to be oh one week between football yeah, games. Yeah, the very next game they're yeah. To go. How about that? Go figure. <laughs> but well, uh, people that are using our stuff kind of notice, oh, they don't always recover till like day fourteen or day twenty-one, which actually matches with all the physiological studies. Yeah. So day 14, they look pretty clear and they're asymptomatic. So that's that's our sample acute concussion study. We've got a whole bunch of case studies in concussion that we're not going to talk about right now because we're going to jump into the next slide. Hey. Hey, that was a pretty good lunch break. Welcome to the next slide, whatever <laughs> number it is. Uh, well, the next slide is called assessing treatment efficacy and we have outcomes from four patients and four different clinicians those of you who are not familiar with vernacular which I certainly wasn't back when I was just doing animal studies oh as a wee child 10 years ago or 15 years ago uh, outcome measures are when you take a measure of someone of a patient and you say okay this this relates to some neurological process or whatever and what we see here is like you see patient one, two, three, and four, uh, and their data is to the right of the patient ID, and you have pre-treatment and post-treatment uh, data. So going across, you got yep. a patient before they were treated and then after they were treated. And all of these patients were at four different clinicians. And they were all, like what we showed in the last slide was some acute concussion recovery. All of these patients had chronic symptoms of a concussion. Really important. These are people who weren't, were not getting better. I mean, how long were they? They had been in treatment a long time. Yeah, right? so a significant percentage of people who, who get a concussion don't recover right away. And so they become months, chronic. Months and that, or years. Sometimes, yeah, a long time. And then they go, and in some cases, these treatments were right away, almost instantaneous. They got better. They felt better. And, uh, you know, it, it looked good. So, interesting story about this, Bob. Uh-oh. So, first of yeah, all, on, I'm awake. there are four, like I mentioned, four different <laughs> clinicians. They were doing four different things. 
except there was one common element to all these treatments. Do you know so what that? So, any okay, idea what so that actually, was about? I was not directly involved in this clinical study, like the execution of it. So I actually do not know. So we've got we've got you know four people showing before. And that before we think is pretty representative of how they were for a long time, and they're so they're so. Is it correct to say I don't know? Is it correct to say that every one of those people had tried other treatments? Probably, probably. You know, you know they're seeing a doctor, and they're they're to the every one of these people is to the point where they're ready to um, enroll in a TBI study because they want to find something that's well, going to work, right? Yeah, something like that. Well, actually, these this is actually an observational study. Oh, this that, a, okay. This is okay. We're not to the study yet, now. so don't blow it. You know, that's how much I don't know about <laughs> what he's talking about. Okay, so so these are the, just observational studies that we did long before and so the what TBI sorts of study. Things we were keep, people doing? They're doing well, chiropractic maybe. Yeah, right? some were okay. chiropractic, some were traditional medicine, some were naturopathic. Okay, now, but now I know where they all use the same from. thing. Now there I know. one common element to all all of these treatments, and that common element was. Pulsar electromagnetic field. Aha. Uh -huh. So here's a time where so we... So let me ask you this question because I don't know the answer. Were they using my system that I developed? Were they using something else? Were they using both? You know? they, were, they were all using your system. Oh, okay. So the funny story about this is keep in mind, I, I, presented, I presented this to a big group of scientists. And, uh, you know, I actually, the, the presentation was much longer. It was like your typical one hour long, an hour long where I had to go through all the scientific principles of the brain gauge and all the measures and all the validation studies and all that. And group scientists were sitting there go, wow, that's really impressive. And then I showed this slide and everybody was like pretty impressed. Wow. And then somebody in the audience asked me a question. And this guy happened to be a former administrator of a fairly large division at NIH. <laughs> and he was the, uh, Not which say names. Had, we won't say any names, but he said, wow, oh, he was all interested. He said, well, what was the treatment? What drug did they take? Wow, that must be a great drug because whatever it is, they, it's really working. <laughs> and when I told him, then, when I told him what that drug was, which was no drugs, it was pulse electromagnetic field. Wah, wah. And he said, ha, huh, well, they only got better because they wanted to get better. <laughs> and yeah. I said, really? So all the other data, I'd showed all other studies and everything else was okay. Well, to the credit of the audience, they sort of turned on him. And it was kind of interesting yeah. to watch. You know, People are getting kind of tired of this, you know, <laughs> like anything that's not mainstream, you know, drug peddling is. is He's definitely effective. in the mainstream and pushing the, pushing that heart and soul. And he just said, ah, humbug. Okay. So to prevent the grumpiness from spiraling <laughs> out of control, are we ready to go to the next slide? Well, we're oh, going to preface the next slide by saying the next, because this was an observational study, four different clinicians, four different patients. Four completely different treatments, except one solid element, that leads us to say, how do we do a real study? Yeah. A real bona fide pilot study. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Alrighty, we're on the next slide. And we're going to talk about a TBI study. This is a pilot study, IRB approved and everything, where a clinician uh, recruited TBI patients and treated them with pulse electromagnetic field with the M1. Yeah, so actually we, we used a version of the micropulse system that I had, had modified specifically for this study. And so so these, I know quite a bit more about these data. So, so, the, so the patients on, on this particular slide all had chronic mild TBI. And we're only showing four patients, but look at, look at their scores on the left-hand side under pre-treatment. So the way to read this is, okay, each patient is, is horizontal. It's three graphs, right? So we got a graph for how they were before treatment started. And then at two months, in the top one is two months into treatment and then five months into treatment. But it tells you the time delay on, on each graph. Okay, so that's how you read it. So it's each one, each horizontal group of three is one person progressing through treatment. No. And there's, there's, there's an interesting thing to talk about here, which we'll, we'll, we'll maybe find Professor Know-It-All and see if we can get some insight <laughs> I don't know that. if he's in today. Well, we'll, we'll check out it. with him and, and talk about variability. And are, do you think every patient is identical? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, all anyway, patients, we'll, all we'll, people <laughs> are identical genetically okay. and at every level. <laughs> yeah, of course. Just like lab, lab mice. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, the thing to notice, the first, there's several things to notice here. 
first thing to notice is that from left to right, everybody in their study got better. That's it's pretty impressive. Now, and, this is the groups that were, they were, as I mistakenly thought in the earlier data, that I thought we had recruited to. But these are the groups we actually recruited into, right, based on uh, the clinician who was was seeing these people or people that knew right. them that hadn't responded to and prior. These treatment. people had had chronic mild TBI symptoms for years and months and years and basically just hadn't recovered. And yeah. This, this wasn't a matter of somebody who had just been on a motor vehicle accident or just had a fall and started treatment. And so you couldn't tell if they were getting better from the treatment or getting better from just natural recovery. These people couldn't get better. Take a particular note and look at the bottom left-hand slide. This person could barely do the test. Yeah. And they, they basically failed completely but a is, month is later is that uh, severe tbi or nope, was that nope nope that's the next slide like, oh, okay next so, slide. so that's like not even the worst possible right. case for not TBI. the worst possible case we'll show, show you something really bad in a minute but these guys all got better now there is one other thing to notice about this and this is getting into we're breaking our one minute per slide rule <laughs> but that's okay it's interesting mm. so one of the things is uh how, where were the electrodes placed? That's one thing that we're always asked. I am ready. The to electrodes were not actually placed in the same place during the entire study. So Bob is going to demo. So yeah. So, so the so first first part of the study, we believe, they were, they were, as, as we understand, they were placed trans temporally. No, farther forward. Farther forward, trans temporally, right? Trans so temporally, then back. Right there, and then back a little back bit, a little bit like more. Trans occipitally. And right? then, yep. So and, and then. And then in the end, they were placed front and back, right? Mm -hmm. it's just like that. Now, so. the reason they were placed front and back is because I was sort of, I was sort of sneak peeking at the results during the first few weeks, and I noticed. I said, you know what? A lot of these measures are getting better. Look, look at the two month on the top there. Look, look at that. All those guy, all those measures on the very top mm -hmm. were getting better. But timing perception was not getting better. It was sort of lagging everything. If you're really into brains, this is this is the interesting part. And so <laughs> basically, I contacted the guy involved in the study, and I said, you know, you may want to think clinician. about including the cerebellum on this stuff, and that might improve. And so, so he moved the electrodes to front back. Right. So let me let me just comment again, right? The study started out with people going transtemporally, sort of like this, and then moved to transoccipital. Sort of like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the improvements were there, but they weren't really as profound as, as Mark was thinking they ought to be. And because he was using a brain gauge, he was able to tell what part of the brain wasn't really coming back up. It was cerebellum because that is really involved heavily in a lot of these timing tasks and cerebellum's back here. So his recommendation using the data from the brain gauge for specific individual subjects and their recovery vector is able to say, well, try placing coils front and back because that way for sure you're getting the back of the head, the cerebellum, and the results were? Results were pretty positive. Looks like everybody positive. got all better. All of a sudden, so, so the, the whole brain started getting better. So the sort of the message to all you brain hackers out there who are trying to use the M1 to, or or use anything to, to modify your brain, it's like see which, see which measures get better. And... Yeah, yeah, let's move on to the next slide. All right, we're ready for the next one. Next slide. And now we're going to, this is more of the study because all the patients that were recruited, they had chronic TBI conditions, some mild, some moderate, some severe. Now, take note that uh, if you have severe TBI, you probably can't be tested with a brain gauge, but a few years later, you may or may not be able to. Uh, these people had the severe TBI at the time they had the accident, and they were pretty moderately dysfunctional when they when they started. So again, we have pretreatment uh, on the far left and final uh, final results to the far right. But look at the bottom left hand corner. That's a severe t TBI uh, former yeah, patient who who could not complete the test. So if somebody can't complete the test. That's that's the measure right there. They you know and but basically look how well they did two weeks and and a month later, a month later that number the the patient at the bottom patient number eight actually had some pretty respectable results. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, from pre That one's amazing because that they actually that person is coming into almost entirely normal green values with a few that are a little bit low, and that's only four weeks into it. So it didn't really even carry it out as far as some of the other ones, like that went six weeks or so. That's yeah, so, so all of these people look very good and, 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 well, look much better. They all look much better at the end of treatment versus pre-treatment. And that was sort of the point of the study. So, Right, so the, the point also is that you don't have to stop there, right? So there's, there's things that we do in scientific studies if I may extemporaneous here a little mm -hmm. bit, because that's really all I ever do, is um, is just tell you what's on my mind. And this is an important thing. I get a lot of questions about this study. Mark gets a lot of questions. Uh, the clinician who ran it with us gets a lot of questions. He's an expert in PM if he knows more than I do by a long shot. And um, one of the things is, you know, exactly what was the protocol you used in the study and exactly how long did you run it and everything. Well, scientific studies are never made to figure out the optimal protocol for doing something so much as does it work or not? You want to test group A versus group B and show there's a significant difference between the two. So the way to view this data is not so much as what's the optimal protocol. The way to view this data is does your intervention have an effect on the clinical outcome? Yes or no? The question of what would make it optimal for people, things that are pretty obvious are use it a little bit more, uh, experiment with the coil placement on your head. Remember, Mark had some insights into that. Continue to use it more than a month. And in fact, the clinician told me, he said that uh, people really did have to use it out beyond the end of the study to get more permanent uh, lasting results because if they stopped right at the end of the study, they'd kind of go backwards a little bit. So these are all important things. And once again, this, that's sort of like a general statement about science. You, want, you don't really want to do exactly what's in a study. You want to have the study tell you what's what seems likely to work, and then you have to sort of intelligently say, well, if I'm going to optimize it, i got to... You know, yeah, I think you might have to measure yourself if you're going to optimize it. You might so, have to measure yourself. So, so one of the things that Mark was talking about is you couldn't do any of this if you didn't have a measure of brain health, right? You'd just be sort of guessing. Do I feel better or not? Was it something I ate? Was it something that's making, you know, that's really helping? Um, and that's where, that's, that's the point of the brain gauge is that it gives you these reliable, repeatable, easily taken measures that can show you whether or not something you're doing doesn't have to be PEMF, could be anything, whether that thing is helping your brain or not. All right, let's go to the next slide. And we're back to the last data slide. Yeah, you're going to be happy to know this is the last slide. And so basically, uh, it's just a composite graph where we clumped everybody's data together. So they showed, well, their cortical metric, which is all their measures combined. And that's what this is, is comparing the cortical metric pretreatment versus post-treatment. And, you know, you could say, uh, by humbug, that doesn't show any difference. It was like, well, actually, all the outcome variables that were collected on these patients besides the cortical metric, things like, you know, other, other questionnaires and other measures of their overall function improved the same, very well. Uh, but, you know, this was just clearly the best measure for looking at this. So the next topic we're going to talk about is what are the critical variables of an experiment that involve brain health? Or we might just ask another viewer question. I don't know. But whatever. We'll, we'll figure out what the next topic is somewhere between beers. That's right. Anyway, that's... Thanks a lot. I think we're done. That That's good enough for, for enough. this episode. I feel like I'm done, and I think well, we're out of beer. one last actually... thing. This is a really long one. So anybody that happened to suffer through this entire video, uh -oh, I know make, this make sure you know we have a discount code hidden on... It's not searchable, Not it's uh, not... But there is a word. There's probably a word somewhere on, on here that's a hidden discount code. Cleverly somewhere yeah. in the video. That yep. would get you a discount, <laughs> and all you got to do is go ahead and check it out and see what it is. All right, we're done? We are done. Thanks a lot for sticking with us. That was real science.